gonna go ahead and get started. So we're glad you're here this morning. Welcome to today's live stream program with Streamable Learning and Museum of the Rockies. My name's Angie Weikert. I'll be your host for today's program. In just a minute, I'll introduce you to Amy Atwater. Amy and I both work at Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman, Montana. As you can tell, like all of you, we're working from our homes. While our museum's temporary closed to the public, we're excited to share our museum's collections with you from here in our houses. Before we get started, let's talk about a couple important things to know about the platform we're using, Zoom. You have two ways to interact with us today. You can use the chat box and the Q&A or question and answer area. Um, Amy may ask you a question, like we just did as we were getting going. And if you have an answer for her, you can type it into the chat box. I'll read as many responses as I can to her out loud. So if you haven't already, go ahead and try it now. Type into that chat box where you're from and what grade you're in, and we'll be excited to see you this morning. I see a lot of people using that chat box and we're so happy to have everybody here. So great job. The second feature that you can use is the Q&A section. And that's the area that you can ask Amy questions. Um, if you type into the chat box, there's a lot of folks in here and I may not see your questions. So go ahead and use that chat, use that Q&A area to ask Amy a question and we'll get to as many as we can. So I see a couple questions here that we'll type in the answer to. Um, Mr. Graham asked where the Museum of the Rockies is and we'll get to that in just a minute. After today's programs, we will send your teachers an email about more programs from us here at Museum of the Rockies and Streamable Learning. We're excited to interact with you and share the museum's content from our houses to yours. So I'm gonna go ahead and hide my video screen so you won't be able to see me anymore, but you'll hear my voice throughout the presentation sharing your answers and your questions with Amy. So please help me welcome Amy Atwater from Museum of the Rockies for today's presentation on prehistoric mammal adaptations. Thanks for joining us today, Amy. Hi everyone, thank you so much Angie for that introduction and for having me today. I am very excited to hear uh, and see so many folks joining us today for this live stream, especially on mammals, one of my favorite subjects of all. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'm going to share my screen, which will allow you to see my presentation here. And we're going to go ahead and get started. So today we're going to be talking about prehistoric mammals and a lot of their adaptations that allowed them to survive as we still have all sorts of mammals around us today, including ourselves. We are also mammals. Uh, so we're going to talk about uh, mammals from the age of the dinosaurs all the way through uh, recent mammals from the Ice Age. Before we do that, just to give you context about Museum of the Rockies where we're located, we are, um, hold on one second, let me just make sure I can get into this. There we go. Here we are, uh, Museum of the Ro Rockies is located in uh, Bozeman, Montana. We are above uh, Yellowstone National Park and we are south of the Canadian border there by a little ways. So to zoom in, you can see within the state of Montana, we're south centrally located. Again, uh, very close to Yellowstone National Park. Uh, and when you come visit Museum of the Rockies, when we're reopened, uh, you will be greeted by Big Mike. Uh, Big Mike is a bronze statue of a Tyrannosaurus Rex skeleton uh, that was discovered in Montana. Museum of the Rockies does boast the highest collection of uh, Tyrannosaurus Rex fossils in the entire world. Uh, so where do I fall into all of this? Well, I, uh, my name again is Amy Atwater. I am the Paleontology Collections Manager and Registrar at Museum of the Rockies. Uh, so it is my job to keep track of all of those fossils and all those T-Rex fossils and all the mammal fossils too. Uh, my background, uh, I, I grew up in Oregon. I have my bachelor's degree from the University of Oregon, go Ducks, in geological sciences. And I have a master's degree from the University of Texas at Austin where I studied uh, primate evolution in their anthropology department. Uh, now I work at Museum of the Rockies, uh, where I keep track of our fossil resources, and I also study fossil dogs. So here in this photo, you can see a lot of fossil dogs, and as well as a lot of uh, the skulls from modern dogs, including wolves and coyotes and foxes and domestic dogs as well. 
we're going to be talking more about dogs and some of their adaptations that have allowed them to survive for over 30 million years uh, here shortly. Uh, to give you an overview about what we're going to be chatting about today, uh, we're going to be talking about mammals, uh, essentially starting from some of the oldest mammal fossils, working our way to some of the most recent mammal fossils. So some of those oldest fossils are going to be uh, in the age of dinosaurs. Um, as we uh, go through, we're also going to do a few specimen spotlights. So those are the things in all caps, including primates, oreodonts, and dogs. So that's when I will actually stop the screen share and I will be showing some specimens, some replicas that I have here at home. And we'll end by talking about the Ice Age mammals uh, and the Montana fossil record of those Ice Age megafauna as well. So mammals have a very, very long paleontological history. And by that, I mean there is a very long fossil record for mammals. And I don't just mean, oh, a couple hundred years or even a couple thousand years. I am talking about hundreds of millions of years. Mammals have been around and have been leaving their fossils behind for us to study. So here on this slide, you can see what we call a strat column. That's what's on the left. It's essentially showing the many layers of, our, of the earth and of all the rock layers that have been deposited. So you're going to always have your uh, oldest rocks at the base, and then the younger rocks are going to be deposited on top of that, creating almost a layer cake or a parfait, if you will, of geologic time. So if you look right there in the middle by the period called the Triassic, there's a big red arrow there, and that is when we have the first fossil evidence of mammals. So that was about 210 million years ago is when we had our first mammals uh, show up on Earth and evolve from a common ancestor. And then that was during the Mesozoic time period, which is what we would think of as the age of dinosaurs. Who thinks we're still in the age of dinosaurs versus maybe in a different age today? Hmm? What age are we in today? I'll give you a hint. It's written up there on the screen. Yes. So you can type right into that chat box if you've got an answer for Amy of what age we are living in today. Mammals first show up? first show up in the age of dinosaurs and today we're in what age? We have guesses of the Holocene, the Cenozoic. Nice. Good, good. Yes, the Cenozoic is the fancy science word for all of the age of mammals. So the Cenozoic uh, came after the age of dinosaurs and it is characterized by a lot of mammals. And uh, starting about 66 million years ago, and we are still in the Cenozoic time period today. Uh, so great job with that. And what we can see here on the right is some of the diversity of animals that we have from the age of mammals. Again, at the bottom are our oldest animals, and towards the top are our most recent Ice Age animals like giant ground sloths and mammoths and mastodons. So first, we're going to talk about those really, really, really old mammals. Cretaceous mammals have a good record here in Montana. We uh, do have rocks that are older than the Cretaceous, um, such as the Jurassic and the Triassic time period, but we don't have very many mammal fossils from those units. But here at Museum of the Rockies, we do have a large collection of Cretaceous mammals. So the Cretaceous was at the end of the age of the dinosaurs and it ended with the extinction of all dinosaurs except birds and really uh, gave way for the age of mammals. So Cretaceous mammals are interesting because they had to coexist with these giant predators. So most Cretaceous mammals are very, very small. And uh, that includes one example here is a multi-tuberculate. Uh, Multi-tuberculate is not only a fun name to say, but is a very cool type of animal. Uh, it's a rodent-like mammal that, that persisted in the fossil record for over 100 million years. So that's longer than any mammal has ever persisted in geologic time. And it lived, uh, it started out in the uh, Jurassic period and it lived all the way through the extinction event and made it into the middle of the age of mammals. 
Multi-tuberculates get their name because of their really crazy cool teeth. Um, it, multi-tuberculates means mul multiple tubercles. And uh, you can see on the right side of the screen some very interesting teeth. I like to think of teeth of multi-tuberculates as like um, if you had a Lego brick and a cheese grater and you brought them together to make one thing, it would look like a multi-tuberculate tooth. So they're full of lots of ridges and crests. And uh, that is to be extremely efficient at chewing food. So multi-tuberculates persisted so long through the fossil record because of all those different teeth that you can see. Premolars that had big blades and big crunching molars to grind and uh, chew all that food allowed them to be uh, successful in many different environments. And they only went extinct because modern rodents showed up and were even better at chewing their food than so multi-tuberculates are actually most closely related to living monotremes. Had anyone heard of monotremes before? Want to uh, wanna give us some names of these animals that we see here for these monotremes, very, very, very primitive mammals, very basal mammals that multi-tuberculates were closely related to. Monotremes. Any idea about what animals today are monotremes? You mean, is that a group of animals that we're responding to, like t different types of monotremes? It's, yes, thank you, Angie. Uh, okay. There are different types of monotremes. So the two that are still alive today are on the left side of the screen here, these photographs. Uh, does anyone know the name of either of those animals or both of those animals that are We've monotremes? We've got so many great responses coming in, Amy. There's a lot of platypus. There's nice. porcupine. I'm trying to catch up here. Uh, I've got a guess of a beaver in there too. Yes. Oh, God. A platypus looks like a mixture of a duck and a beaver. It's a fun animal. So platypus and the animal on top is actually called an echidna. Um, sometimes they're called a spiny anteater, um, though that actually, their name is echidnas, and they live in Australia uh, as well as platypus do. And they are very primitive mammals. And so multi-tuberculates with their cheese grater teeth uh, would have been most closely related to these animals that we now have today in Australia. Um, monotremes are very ba um, primitive mammals. They actually still lay like eggs. They do not give live birth like all other mammals do. Uh, and they still have fur though, and they still have a lot of characteristics that firmly put them as mammals. Another Cretaceous mammal that we have is called, is a marsupial called Didelphodon. Didelphodon is uh, very similar to living possums that we have today. So if you're used to the Virginia possum that we'll have here in North America, Didelphodon was almost exactly the exact same size as that, as our living um, opossums and had very similar teeth and adaptations, except Didelphodon lived from 73 to 66 million years ago, a lot before uh, living possums. So uh, on the bottom right, you can see a jaw of specimen that we have here at Museum of the Rockies that has a tooth in place and then there's a tooth above it, an isolated tooth in the middle. What you will notice about these teeth is that they have a and severe um, shearing planes. And that again is allowing didelpha, would have allowed didelphodon to be extremely efficient with chewing uh, and would have been able to process lots of animals and um, uh, invertebrates and insects and even some egg products like you can see here in this one too, maybe eating some dinosaur eggs and allowing them to be very effective chewers. So Cretaceous mammals, um, their adaptations have really been to uh, finesse the mammalian chewing system, which we still are very good at today. And didelphodon, um, like marsupials today, is going to be related to things like kangaroos and um, wombats and wallabies and even Tasmanian devils. And uh, today you're only going to find um, marsupials in what place? What is the one country or continent where you will find uh, these things like kangaroos and wombats and wallabies? We've got a lot of guesses coming in. I'm gonna give everybody just a minute. Um, while those guesses are coming in, Amy, we have a couple questions for you. One, um, 
somebody very timely would like to know if all marsupials have pouches. And then we have a couple questions about the pictures that are on um, your slides and just giving us a, a quick overview of the names of the different animals on there. Ah. So that gave us a few moments for questions, for responses coming in and I see a whole bunch of Australias. Nice, good job. That is correct. Now we only find marsupials or native uh, marsupials besides possums. Um, uh, most marsupials today only live in Australia, but during the age of dinosaurs, uh, they used to live across the entire world. Uh, so it hasn't been until recently. Uh, all of the names in this, this is, I should have explained, apologies. Uh, this is what we call a cladogram or an evolutionary tree. It just shows the relationships. And what we have at the very far, far top point are placental mammals, and that includes us. Uh, so those are animals that have to carry their uh, babies to a certain amount of time before they give birth. Uh, marsupials do all have pouches because they have very, 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 very small babies who then need to crawl up into the pouch and continue to develop in the pouch. Whereas placental mammals like us, we do that still within the mother. Um, and the other animals are a bunch of different extinct type of mammals, uh, starting from some of the most primitive of mammals, getting all the way to the mammals that we know today, like marsupials and um, placental mammals like us. Uh, so now we're going to jump on in to the age of mammals, the Cenozoic. So that's the top portion of the strat column that you see in this photo on the right. Uh, if you want to remember all the different time periods in that, I have a nice little saying, it's put eggs on my plate, please. You start from the bottom and it's Paleocene, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, Pleistocene, Holocene. Put eggs on my plate, please. We then add something for H, like honey, something fun. Uh, so we're going to dive into the oldest part of that, which is the Paleocene. Uh, in Montana, we have some very neat Paleocene mammals, including Plesiodapus and Purgatorius. These are both very primate-like arboreal mammals. Uh, and we know that they would have been arboreal because of some of their features and adaptations. This includes things like having short, robust limbs, uh, having claws to be able to cling in onto uh, branches and onto a, a tree substrate, and having a long, probably bushy tail, uh, which can help a lot with balance and uh, dexterity when uh, working your way through. Uh, an environment that's like uh, that uh, is full of trees where you need to have a good sense of balance. Uh, so these animals would have been very small. They're not entirely um, full-on primates like early um, lemurs or anything, but we will talk about those shortly. Um, after we get through the Paleocene time period, uh, we get into a time period called the Eocene. The Eocene is very spectacular because we see uh, the beginning of a lot of animals that we still have around today. So animals and um, carnivores and primates and rodents, a lot of those animals all show up for the first time in the Eocene. So some examples from the Montana fossil record from the Eocene include the top right photo is of a bronothier. This is a rhino-like mammal that would have had a bony horn over its nose. It was likely using this bony horn similar to how elk use their antlers, which were probably to have a male-male fighting for females, for access to females. I kind of think it looks like it has a um, boomer, or not a boomerang, but a, a slingshot on its face. So maybe it had some other adaptation for that. Blow animal uh, with a white background is Mericoidodon, which is an oreodont, uh, which uh, we'll talk more about oreodonts soon. Uh, then we have another striped animal there in the middle with the, the grassland background. That's Mesohippus. So that's a very early horse that would have been about the size of an average size dog. And it did not have hooves. Uh, hooves evolved over the horse lineage uh, too. And we'll talk about their adaptations as well. We also had hyenodons, which are a group of uh, carnivores that are now extinct. That's that uh, bottom right photo. And then our bottom center photo is hyracodon, which is of a rhino that was also very closely related to horses. So it's called the running rhino. And it has a lot of characteristics of both horses and rhinos, as those animals are very closely related. 
uh, to do a specimen spotlight, the Eocene is when we see early primates, true primates, unlike um, primate-like animals. Like this. Uh, by the Eocene, we have true primates in North America. So we have uh, animals that are, uh, we find fossils of primates that are very closely related to tarsiers and lemurs. So the photo on top here is of a tarsier and the photo on the bottom is of a ring-tailed lemur. Now I'm going to stop my screen share and I am going to point out and hold up this specimen. So this is the skull of an early Eocene primate called Runia. Uh, it was a, a almost complete skull found in West Texas. Runia would have been a tarsier-like primate. So tarsiers, again, are those ones that look like they've drank way too much coffee. Uh, and they would have, and this lived in North America about 43 million years ago. We know that uh, Runia here is a primate because of special primate adaptations. So one of the things I want to point out about primates that we all have as primates ourselves as forward-facing eyes. So we have forward-facing eyes and we already see a fairly large brain for body size, even in these early, early primates. All right, now I'm gonna go back here. So those forward-facing eyes are really, really helpful to be able to have primates grasp and locate delicious fruit and other things in the trees. Uh, and so, that is a very cool specimen and very, very small. So if you like small mammals, uh, the evolution of early primates in North America is a place for you. And now we're gonna go. There's Runia again, uh, just a bit smaller picture. This is a replica. This is not the real specimen. The real specimen is under lock and key at a museum in Texas. Amy, this is a good point so for me to jump in and ask you a question about the specimens that you do have. Um, there was a great question of if we took anything home from the museum while well, we are temporarily um, working from home. Uh, so the only things that um, we were permitted to take home are replicas or casts. So this one, um, I'll show you another one here in a moment of a dog skull. It looks very realistic because it was painted to look exactly like the fossil, but it is not the actual fossil. So all of the fossils are still at the museum. What I have with me today are replicas or casts is the scientific term for a replica uh, that allow us to share these programs. And uh, now moving on so we can show you that next replica. Uh, we're gonna talk about the middle of the age of mammals, which includes some really cool animals, including the very large Oriodont Promerica curis. Just another fun name to say, you know, we want something nice to roll off the tongue. Uh, what you can also see in the middle is Myohippus. So this is a three-toed horse that's bigger than the last horse we learned about but it still has three toes as opposed to the one toe that horses have today. Uh, so the change in horse toes uh, has been an adaptation to their lifestyle to living in open grasslands as opposed to woody, uh, woody woodlands, <laughs> sounds funny, uh, that these early horses would have been living in. Uh, then this big cat looking critter at the bottom center of the screen is Pogonodon. Uh, Pogonodon is what we would call a false saber tooth cat in that it had saber teeth, it looked a lot like a cat, but it isn't actually a true cat. It is a cousin, a cat cousin, if you will. Very closely related to cats. Uh, it looks a lot like cats, but does have some significant differences. We have a skull of Pagonodon on display in the Cenozoic Corridor at Museum of the Rockies that I encourage you to check out when we reopen. Uh, again, I love all small mammals, and so we can't ignore things like shrews and insectivores uh, that we also find in our fossil record. Uh, these sorts of animals have very efficient teeth for being able to process lots of food um, very quickly to uh, be able to stick with their high metabolisms. Okay, so now we're going to go, I'm going to stop my share again. We're going to give a shot at talking about oreodonts. Okay, 
This is the skull of an Oreodont. What kind of things do you think this animal would have been eating? Here's some of its other teeth as well. Up close view. What kind of things do you think Oreodonts would have been eating in their ecosystems? This is fun. And this is a replica again. This is a cast of an actual fossil skull. All right, we've got a lot of guesses coming in, Amy. We have a lot of meat. We have right. rodents, shrews, plants, bears, other animals, carnivores, bunnies, leaves, meats and plants, meat or fish, omnivore, both. A lot of great guesses. Nice. Oh, I like the thinking. I like the creativity. I, uh, I like to ask that question because Oreodonts had really big canines, these big fang teeth in the front, uh, but they weren't necessarily using them to eat other animals. They were more fighting with each other, uh, very similar to maybe how a pig would fight with another pig. Uh, so Oreodonts, I do think of them as sheep, pig, camel mammals. They're a fun combination of all of those things. And they were actually herbivores. They were vegetarians. And their teeth, if we do again, focus on, these are the upper teeth, a replica of the upper teeth of an Oreodont. And uh, I want you to notice if you've ever seen horse or not, if you've ever seen deer teeth or cow teeth, are moose or caribou or elk, they're going to have very similar teeth. And these teeth are really good for eating woody browsing material, like twigs and leaves and branches. So all of these crests help the animals slice up all of that vegetarian matter, uh, very similar to like deer that you see grazing today. They have very sharp teeth, uh, that they're using to essentially be a salad spinner and slice up all that salad. Let's go back to my screen here. Amy, while you go back to your screen, um, a, a great question as you're holding up casts. Um, somebody asked why we have these casts or replicas when there's the real thing. Why do we make replicas? Why do we make replicas? That is a great question. Uh, so there's multiple reasons. I think the main reason is that fossils are extremely fragile. They're millions of years old and they have, are irreplaceable. Uh, so you can't, if we were to put um, an actual T-Rex skeleton outside on display, then what happens if some of those bones uh, fall or break, uh, then that is uh, we don't want to put the risk to the skeleton of the specimen itself, so we create replicas, scientifically accurate replicas, to preserve and keep the fossils safe. Uh, replicas are also great to use for educational experiences like this. Uh, it looks exactly like the real thing, uh, but it's not as fragile, and it is a good, and you can make multiples of them, so you can share with a large audience as having just one fossil that you share with maybe just a small tour group. Uh, so they're great for that and we use them for exhibit display. Uh, if you don't have necessarily a complete fossil but you still want to have that animal represented in your museum exhibits, then you might use replicas to have uh, that animal well represented uh, without having all of the fossil material to do so. All right, we're getting there, guys. Uh, so now I'm going to jump into some of the more recent mammals that we have uh, a fossil record of in North America. Uh, so some examples from Montana include Embelodon. Uh, so that's this animal, this elephant looking animal you see in the upper right. Uh, this is, uh, we call this, this type of elephant relative a gompotheer. Uh, and what's interesting about gompotheres as opposed to modern elephants is that they have two sets of tusks. So modern elephants really only have upper tusks, whereas gompotheres would have had the lower set of tusks too, which is why some people actually call them shovel tuskers because they may have been using those lower tusks to help dig and look for uh, browsing and, and tubers and uh, roots and, and food supplies like that. 
on the bottom, another cool uh, Montana fossil. I bet a lot of folks don't necessarily think of rhinos when you think of Montana, but we do have a very, very good fossil record of rhinos in Montana. So this is Teleoceros. Uh, this is a, the short-legged rhino and they are hypothesized to have lived in a very hippo-like environment uh, and that they would have been semi-aquatic uh, with their shorter limbs, their very, very round barrel-chested um, form that they would have been well adapted to that lifestyle. Uh, continuing with the Miocene time period, uh, so we have horses still at this time period. So up on the upper right, you can see uh, the fossil foot of a horse. So the part of uh, the far left is a hoof, a fossil horse hoof. So horses by this time period, this is about 15 million years ago, did have a true hoof. But what I really want you to uh, want to draw to your attention is what I've circled in red here, which is a vestigial toe. Uh, so vestigial is a term for uh, a part, a, an anatomy, part of the anatomy that is no longer used for what it originally was evolved for. And so horses, as we saw, used to be on three toes. Now they're only on one toe, but they still have little remnants of those past toes uh, that are still present. And so that's what you're seeing in this fossil, our vestigial toes. Uh, kind of like our appendix is a vestigial organ. Uh, and so modern horses today don't even have these vestigial toes. They just have the one main toe. And we see this change from actually five toes to three toes to one toe uh, as an adaptation to deal with the open grasslands that came through North America during this time period, about 30 to 15 million years ago. And we see that in their teeth as well. So that middle photo with the crazy looking uh, swir swirls and whatnot, those are horse teeth, fossil horse teeth. And uh, those also are very complex with all those swirls of enamel to help strengthen the horse's teeth against all that grass they're eating. Grass is very uh, abrasive. And so horses have evolved very tall teeth with very complex enamel to deal with that high grit. All right, so now we're going to talk about dogs. Um, in the bottom here is a picture of, this is the actual fossil here. I'm gonna show you a cast here pretty quickly. Borophagines are bone crushing dogs. Uh, now, um, Borophagines lived about uh, 36 million years ago to 2.5 million years ago. They're known for having very powerful jaws and teeth that would have been able to crunch through bone. And we have quite a few uh, of them known from Montana. Um, uh, uh, bone crushing dogs are a type of carnivorin. So carnivorin is a group of as um, an order of mammals uh, that includes all of these animals that you see here. Um, carnivorins are split into between the filiforma, the cat-like carnivorins, and caniforma, the dog-like um, carnivorins. And so carnivorins are united by having teeth and claws that are adapted for catching and eating animals. Uh, so we can be, we can recognize carnivorans because of their teeth. So a lot of these animal adaptations we're talking about, we see in the teeth. So I'm sure if you have a dog at home or a cat at home, you may have even seen these teeth. Um, these are their carnassials. So they're being pointed out in the upper photo here. It's a lower molar and an upper premolar. So they're the teeth that look like a really big mountain range in an, uh, a carnivore's mouth. And they are uh, well adapted to slice against each other, to slice and dice. They're very, very good at uh, slicing and shearing through meat. So that is an adaptation we see with carnivorans, including dogs, to be able to be well adapted to their carnivorous lifestyle. Uh, so here is, um, uh, the, the dog skull here, and I'm actually just going to stick with this photo as it works out fairly well as well. So you can see uh, that those teeth are um, creating that um, carnassial complex of this dog skull that we have here at the museum as well, with all of its teeth, which is pretty fascinating. This dog skull is about 15 million years old, 
and every single tooth is well preserved, which is more than I can say for my own dog's teeth, for that matter. Amy, I've got a couple All questions right. to interrupt you yeah. with here. Um, can yeah. you, this question came earlier, but it's a great time to ask it now. Can you clarify why you say fossil dogs? And then can you quickly tell us if these dogs that you're talking about now may be related to wolves? Ah, excellent. So I say fossil dogs because um, bone crushing dogs, or I use air quotes, because uh, they are now extinct and they are not true canines. So this goes into how we name animals and uh, all dogs alive today are in a subfamily called the canines, including wolves and foxes and coyotes and domestic dogs. And the bone crushing dogs are actually borophage genes. So they're not true canines. Uh, now, uh, Borophage genes and, uh, would not have given rise to the modern wolf, but would have been a very, very close relative. And we know that they ate bones because we find them in their fossil poop, which is pretty fantastic. Fun job, paleontologist. All right, well, I'm gonna cruise through here before we have to get out of here. Uh, but now we're into the ice age. So we see animals like mammoths and mastodons. So we have a mammoth on the left and a mastodon on the right. Mastodons would have been slightly smaller and wouldn't have had quite as curved tusks. When you look at their teeth, their teeth are very different. Mammoths have teeth a lot like a horse in that they have lots of grinding adaptations uh, and lots of enamel to deal with that abrasive grass. So it's flat and a grinding surface. On the right, you can see a mastodon tooth, which looks more like the oreodont tooth. It's full of uh, mountains and peaks, uh, and all that um, complexity allows it to be good at browsing uh, woody material in a woodland environment. Uh, we also have a mammoth uh, here in Montana that preserves the earliest signs of humans at 12,300 years old. There are butcher marks on this mammoth skeleton from Montana that was found near Glendive. Uh, we had quite a few other cool Ice Age mammals, cool, literally. Uh, at this time, we had bison, including bison that were more than twice the size of modern bison with giant uh, uh, huge, huge horns. We had giant ground sloths. We had camels. We had American lions. Uh, we had uh, musk, ox musk oxen and so many more. Uh, we did experience an extinction event at the end of the ice age or during the ice age that was probably caused by a bunch of different factors, not just one, including climate change, overhunting from early humans, disease, uh, invasive animals such as bison, and even an asteroid impact like what affected the dinosaurs 66 million years ago. There isn't one specific answer for why all of these megafauna went extinct, uh, but there are a lot of lines of evidence that I encourage you all to go investigate or whatever aspect of this interests you to pursue that further. Uh, I just wanted to end with some just rep in the mammals as much as possible, that we have a long fossil record of mammals. We see them go through a bunch of different body sizes. We see mammals change their teeth a lot. We see them change their environment a lot. And it is all, all of these adaptations have allowed mammals to rule the modern age like we do today. Uh, so with that, I want to say thank you. And I want to be sure to have you check out more of our uh, Museum of the Rockies online resources at museumoftherockies.org slash learn. Uh, so thank you all for joining me and I'll take any questions if we have time. Thank you. Let's, uh, let's do two questions. There are so many great questions in here and we're not gonna be able to get to all of them, unfortunately. Amy, can you help us distinguish again between dinosaurs and mammals? Ah, great. Uh, the di distinguishing between dinosaurs and mammals. Uh, so dinosaurs are a group of reptiles and uh, that are now extinct. And uh, mammals are within a different branch of the, the animal family tree in that we branched off from reptiles long before dinosaurs ever show up. Uh, so we don't replace our teeth throughout our entire lives like reptiles. Uh, we, don't, we don't have... Um, and uh, not very many mammals uh, lay eggs anymore. There's a lot of these characteristics that we see in um, reptiles that we don't see in mammals that are different. But really the difference comes from different ancestors and the different roots of an evolutionary family tree.
Great. Um, and with that, the last question that we'll answer is, um, are we going to be doing more of these programs soon? So I'm going to come back online here and say hello to you all. So we are so excited that you had a great time today. So many wonderful questions. Thank you all for participating. Um, Museum of the Rockies will be doing more programs in partnership with Streamable Learning this spring. Um, and so you can look for those uh, at museumoftherockies.org. You can check out uh, Streamable Learning for all the other program partners that are providing um, lessons. Uh, and then we will send an email to all of our teachers that are on our mailing list when we have that calendar ready too. So thanks again, everybody, so much for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your day. Um, and we'll see you again soon here from our homes on behalf of Museum of the Rockies and Streamable Learning. Have a great day.